Welcome to this episode of the Australian Naval History podcast series. It is a production of the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute of Australia, and the Sea Power Centre of Australia. I'm Commander Alistair Cooper. Mine warfare is one of the most effective forms of war at sea. It works not only by sinking ships, but by changing what people think they can do. It is one of the oldest forms of what is now sometimes called hybrid war. Mine warfare is also one of the most o easily overlooked forms of war at sea. To make sure this is not the case for our listeners, this podcast will look at Australia's extensive Second World War operations to counter the mining campaign conducted by Germany and Japan, a campaign which occurred just off our coast. It sank many ships and could have sunk many more were it not for the Australian Navy mine countermeasures. We'll also cover the mine laying operations conducted by the Australian Navy, which created defensive minefields to protect Australia's coastal shipping. To do this, I'm joined by three experts. Commodore Heck Donoghue, now retired, who was an underwater warfare specialist in the Royal Australian Navy. He co-authored United and Undaunted, The First 100 Years, a history of diving in the Royal Australian Navy, 2011, sorry, 1911 to 2011, and most recently, Australian Minesweepers at War. Also by Mr. Mike Turner, a scientist who ran the Mine Warfare Group at the RAN Research Laboratory for many years, and is the other co-author of Australian Minesweepers at War. And finally, by Commander David Wright, one of the Australian Navy's Mine Warfare Specialists who currently serves in Navy Strategic Command. General Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. David, if I could start with you, could you explain what sea mines are and what types of mine we have? Okay, as you mentioned in your introduction, Alice, sea mines have been around for a long time, uh, starting off with the Chinese, working through the various centuries, probably coming to prominence with uh, the American Civil War and the Crimean War, and then substantially First World War and the Second World War. Sea mines are basically um, weapons that you put into the water. Uh, they don't move like torpedoes or missiles. They'll generally have somewhere between five and a thousand kilograms of high explosive. Um, they can be any shape, but frequently are either a, a truncated cone, a sphere, or a cylinder. Um, they could be made out of anything, whatever suits the, the person or the, the, the organization manufacturing them, but typically steel, aluminium, plastic, fiberglass, wood. Um, and we tend to group them up into a number of categories to try and simplify it. So the first broad category is where a mine will sit in the water column. So they can either lay on the seabed, and we call those ground mines, or if they float, and this is the, the classic mine shape that everyone thinks of, the ball with spikes, they float in the water column and they're called buoyant mines because of their inherent buoyancy. The other key category or way of breaking up mines that we use is how they are actuated. So mines can be either how you set them off, quite right. You can either um, set them off via a contact, and those are called contact mines, and that requires physical contact with the ship or submarine that they are attempting to explode against. Or they can um, be actuated, set off by listening to the, the signatures or the influences, um, which generally are magnetic pressure or acoustic, which is the sound a ship or submarine will make as it goes through the water. Those sorts of mines, because they're listening for influences from a ship, are called influence mines. Okay. Mike Turner, can you just talk in broad terms about how these different types of mines can be, can be defeated or detected? Right. Um, there are two approaches to defeating the mine, passive mine countermeasures and mine sweeping, uh, referring to World War II. Uh, passive mine countermeasures, uh, the idea there is to avoid the mines by uh, either sailing in water too deep for moored mines or uh, creating narrow channels uh, that reduce the mine threat. Other passive mine countermeasures are reducing a ship's signature, magnetic signature so that it's uh, at, at less risk against magnetic mines or um, reducing ship speed very substantially so that they won't operate pressure mines. That's the uh, passive mine canyon measure side. On the sweeping side, uh, a sweeper would tow 
an electric cable sweeps about 500 metres long to uh, sweep mines at a safe distance to stern. Uh, acoustic mines, they would be swept by an acoustic generator towed to beam. On the uh, wire sweeping side, the main sweep was uh, known as an Oropesa sweep. And uh, for this sweep, a sweep wire was diverted to one side to form a giant scythe, if you like, to cut mine moorings. Uh, there were four types of uh, wire sweeping. Um, you had search sweeping, where a sweeper went out, usually on a day running basis, to uh, detect the existence of a minefield outside a port. Uh, clearance mine sweeping, as the name implies, was the actual clearance of a channel or an anchorage. Then you had escort sweeping, where a sweeper proceeded ahead of a prime target, such as a troop ship, uh, to sweep mines ahead of the ship. And there was check sweeping, which was conducted uh, as a final measure, if you like, just to make sure that they had, in fact, cleared the channel. Um, so they were the uh, um, four types of uh, wire sweeping. Heck, it seems to me that um, mine sweeping is a very sophisticated um, technical operation. What sort of uh, mine defences uh, did Australia have in place at the start of the Second World War? Uh, in the interwar years, Australia looked at mine, the, the problem of mining and came up with a, a two-pronged approach. One, to have auxiliary minesweepers, i.e. trawlers and steamships taken up from trade, and also to have a... Uh, first line minesweeper capability based on the Grimsey class slip which they planned to build. The strategy was to have a series of minesweeping groups which consisted of auxiliary minesweepers at various ports around Australia to do as Mike mentioned the, the, check, the um, yeah, check sweeping to confirm nothing was there and then if mines were found then the minesweeping flotilla which consisted of your first class right, would come in to uh, clear the minefield. At the beginning of the war, as the war started, they implemented the plan. They started taking up auxiliary minesweepers. By the end of uh, 1939, they had 12 in service. They then decided to convert the, uh, the sloops. Uh, Swan and Yarra were in service at that point, and they were converted to undergo minesweeping. The two other Grimsey-class ships, the Warrego and Parramatta, were building, and they were converted to include minesweeping in their capability. And uh, by the end of uh, uh, by the end of 1939, the Admiralty had allocated mine sweeping and fertility 20 to uh, the RAN, and in the, the end of that year, it consisted of Swan, Yarra, and two auxiliary ships. It seems that you know, you've mentioned that there are a number of places around the country where where um, mine clearance was being done. So there was. It took a lot of effort um, to be able to, mm. to do it and to maintain the, yeah. the shipping in and out of the country. Surely it couldn't have been accomplished by, by just those four vessels. So did we, did we build more? Yes. In 1938, Captain Collins, who was then the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, wrote a paper that said we need more and smaller slips. That okay. eventually became the Australian Minesweeper. Okay. And uh, it was designed in Australia. Uh, it was called AMS, or Australian Minesweeper, although I think more generally it's known by its term, a corvette. And the AMS, the Australian Minesweeper, was used as a bit of a cover that it was also an anti-submarine vessel. Okay. It, was a it was a great success story. Again, at the uh, 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 war, but when war was declared, they uh, gave approval to build the first seven of the uh, corvettes. In the event, we built 60. 30, uh, 36 for Australia, for the RAN, 20 manned by the RAN but built on Admiralty account, okay. and four for the uh, Indian Navy. They were small ships, 57 metres, about 650 tonnes, speed of about 15 knots, rugged. They were built in eight shipyards around the country, and the engines were built around the country as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a crew of five officers, initially 73 sailors, but as 
technology improved and radars, etc., came into being. Uh, they ended up with about 80. And a 57 metre vessel, that, that's pretty crowded. <laughs> and they're pretty tough to be there. The, the, they, they deployed everywhere. They deployed into the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, the Persian mm -hmm. Gulf, the Pacific, everywhere, and, all, and even in the Atlantic. Okay. So they were everywhere. The, the, the common theme of them was that what they didn't do was stay in harbour long. <laughs> But they, they conducted mine sweeping, they conducted uh, ocean patrolling, anti-submarine warfare, they conducted bombardment, they towed disabled ships, they carried troops, they were engaged in surveying, often within the range of Japanese guns. Mm -hmm. So they were a, a real workhorse. Of, of the 56 that belonged to Australia, 75% or 42 engaged in mine sweeping during World War II. So it really was a very intensive activity. Mm. Um, it, integrated with everything else yeah, that was going on. Yeah. Okay. Mike Heck mentioned um, auxiliary minesweepers taken up from, um, uh, uh, fr from civilian service. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about the auxiliary minesweepers. Right. Um, as Heck mentioned, there was this plan to um, use them to um, mainly for search sweeping at Australian ports. Um, there were very few suitable auxiliary uh, vessels available to be requisitioned. Um, trawlers were the preferred ship because they had an, uh, an existing winch. So just about every available trawler was taken up, um, 13 of them. And then uh, t 22 uh, s steamers were taken up as Heck mentioned. Um, the steamers were nearly all built uh, pre-1926, they had a service speed of nine and a half knots of between 400 and 800 tonnes, uh, whereas the trawlers were much smaller, they were about 200 to 400 tonnes. Um, they also had a service speed of nine and a half knots and uh, they were built before 1921. Uh, they were all or nearly all armed with a 12 pounder. Uh, 12 pounder being a, a, a so, small gun? Um, three something, inch. yeah, th three, yes, yeah, three inch in okay. uh, probably better terminology. And uh, they all had an aura piece of sweep. However, after the Japanese laid ground mines at Brisbane, uh, there were about eight converted to influence sweepers. And at that time, already half of the MSAs had been, had reverted to more useful roles. And so there was only about 18 in 1943. And the others were doing very useful work as uh, stores, vessels, and all, all manner of things distributed around Australia. Um, and uh, at the end of the war, of course, they were all um, decommissioned. Return, return yes, returned to grateful uh, fishing companies. <laughs> Got their trawlers back. One of the big developments uh, through World War Two was the the, um, the introduction of magnetic influence mines, and obviously to to, to counter that, you need to reduce the, the magnetic signature of a of a ship which is a challenge because ships are very large metal objects. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, how that was done right. um, and explain it in a bit more detail. Right. Um, degaussing is a broad term. It covers both the treatment of uh, steel hull vessels and the fitting of coils known as DG coils. Mm -hmm. uh, DG for degaussing. Yes, DG for short for degaussing. Um, the treatment was either known as flashing, wiping or deperming and this involved a, an electric coil which was pulsed in a suitable cycle to uh, not completely demagnetise but reduce the magnetisation of the hull. Okay. Uh, it didn't last forever, it was a temporary uh, measure that and uh, ships would need uh, another, tr one treatment wasn't enough, they'd have to have 
another treatment. Um, the gaussing coils uh, came in th uh, three designs. There was uh, one, one for merchant ships, one for warships, and one for minesweepers. The one for merchant ships was simply a, uh, a single coil wrapped around the hull called an M coil, and that reduced the magnetic field of a merchant ship by about 50%. Uh, for in 1942, the Admiralty introduced what was to become the standard fit for warships, and they split the M coil into three uh, ad adjacent um, coils: one up forward, one amidships, one aft, and uh, that was called a three-part M system for obvious reasons, and that reduced the magnetic field of a warship by 75%. And then finally, uh, with uh, minesweepers, uh, they had wooden hulls, so the idea was, uh, although they did have coils for the hull ship, they also had coils for individual ferrous items, the main engines, for example. Mm -hmm. And they could uh, be made very uh, clean, as we called it, magnetically clean, and could operate in depths as safely in depths as shallow as six metres, so it was a completely different uh, situation with the minesweepers. And this was all equipment permanently installed into with the, the ships? With the coils, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, David, I'm just wondering if you can talk us through a little bit of the efforts that the Australian Navy made towards degaussing um, during the Second World War as yeah. well, please. So it was about December 1940 uh, that the REN, having seen what was occurring in uh, the United Kingdom, in particular with the Germans laying lots of magnetic mines in their fields around England, correctly supposed that the Germans would use magnetic mines were they to lay fields around Australia, and that had occurred by that point in time. So in December 1940, the REN said, right, all future warships and merchant ships built on the Australian register are to be fitted with the gaussing coils. So that was, that was done. Um, the US Navy in 1942 um, built a degaussing range in Sydney Harbour off Bradley's Head. Um, and in fact, if you have a look at the, you know, the mast from HMO Sydney, very close to that, there's a concrete block on the ground. That's the foundations for what was a two-storey weatherboard hut that was there during the war. Probably not a bad place to be posted. <laughs> um, so that was set up in 1942. The US manned it to start with. But once there were sufficient Australians trained, that was handed over in early 1943, and uh, our people ran it for the remainder of the war. So you can have degaussing equipment in ships and a degaussing range in a harbour for ships to pass over. Yes, it's both to, to check the signature, mm -hmm. um, but it, you can also have some systems. Uh, Mike talked about uh, wiping mm -hmm. and deperming. Um, you can achieve some benefits from that. Okay. This was mainly to check the vessels, though, to confirm. To measure the... Yes. Okay. So um, the REN also had a degaussing station in Brisbane at mm -hmm. Lytton. Um, and we had one at Orpheus Island uh, near Ingham, Queensland, Darwin. And the United States Navy operated two, Brisbane and Fremantle, which covered all vessels but were predominantly used for the submarines that the US had based in those two ports. Okay. Thank you. Um, David's mentioned the German mining operations. Um, Germany and the, the war in Europe was a long way from Australia. Um, I'm just wondering if you can explain what the Germans were trying to achieve the, and how did it affect us? Yes, the Germans had a very successful use of raiders, as they called them, armed merchant ships. Okay. And uh, early on the war, 1940, we saw German mining in Australian waters in three waves really. first wave was Orion, a ship uh, called Orion, which had been laying mines off New Zealand, <laughs> came round south of Tassie, and they'd run out of warshot mines, they made four uh, mines using beer kegs, so I guess the crew quite enjoyed that, <laughs> with a horn on the top and they were laid off Albany. Mm. Nuisance value really. Yeah. But the next phase was uh, much more interesting and much more <laughs> detrimental to us, is the, the radar pigman Mm -hmm. She c captured a Norwegian tanker off, uh, was bound for Melbourne from Bata Batavia, okay. captured her off Christmas Island, and in three days they converted it as a mine layer, and in the open ocean, in a padded cutter, they transferred 110 mines on board. 
which would have been, I think they earned their sea pay that day. But Absolutely. the two ships then proceeded in, and they renamed it Passat. Okay. So Penguin and Passat then dispersed and uh, Penguin went uh, up off uh, Sydney, Nora mm -hmm. Head in fact, between Sydney and Newcastle. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of October that year, she laid uh, 40 mines. She then went down a day later, laid another 40 off Hobart. And then a couple of days later, she laid mines uh, off Adelaide. It's often thought it was Backstairs Passage, which is the obvious place, but in fact, from the subsequent sinking yeah. or hitting, it was to the west of Spencer Gulf is where okay. they laid them. She then proceeded off into the Indian Ocean. Now, Passat, she uh, laid mines in the Bass Strait area, northeast Cape and Bank, she laid mines, and then either side of the uh, Bass Strait laid 40 mines to the east and to the west. Okay. Now, uh, Penguin headed off into the uh, wide blue yonder and was sunk by a Royal Navy ship in the Indian Ocean. So her mine lays were never uh, recovered, mm -hmm. but Penguin's were, and after the war we got, uh, sorry, Passat's were, we, we got her uh, mine lays. So we knew where she'd laid mines. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, Penguin was concerned, it, it had to be based on what ships had been sunk. Okay. What did the Australian Navy do to counter this? The Australian Navy, uh, well, the first mine was laid off, uh, was blow a ship off Cape, uh, off Wilson's property in, in late 1940. Quickly, the MSF-20, mine sweeping for Tilda 20, was in mm -hmm. action. And they, uh, probably the most important mine sweeping operation for Australia, they, they quickly swept in that area. Uh, in fact, all the areas where they'd, they'd seen ships. And they... Uh, Slowly, uh, by this time, the corvettes were coming into service mm -hmm. in 41. And so uh, over the period of 1941, about seven corvettes joined mine suite of Fertilla 20. Okay. Warrigo, Swan, Yarra and Parramatta all swept in that period. And uh, by the end of 41, it was decided they'd achieved, you know, that it was safe for ships to transit and MSF 20 was disbanded. Okay. We moved on very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it was a year and a bit. M Mike Turner, I'm just thinking that mines obviously had a, a fairly big impact on what we were able to do. Did we produce our own mines and how did we deploy them if we did? Um, the RAN uh, had a mine depot uh, at Swan Island and it had obsolescent uh, mines supplied by the Admiralty. But in 1938, uh, the RAN got, became serious about making it, building their own mines. So they approached the Ford uh, Motor Company and they um, signed a contract in 1939 uh, and the Ford Motor Company completed what they called a mine uh, construction annex at Geelong uh, in April 1940. They actually started making mines in 1941 and continued through to 1944. In total, they, they um, made 12,561 mines. Wow. That's a lot of mines. And they were ready in time for Bungaree to do her mining, uh, which was pre-Japan uh, entering the war, so you'll appreciate that. Okay. So, 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 and Bungaree was... Oh, so, was uh, well, yes, and Bungaree was um, the only uh, mine layer for Australian mines. Okay. And uh, she was requisitioned, um, fitted out at Garden Island Dockyard as a mine layer and became available in 1941 for mine laying. Okay. Uh, and uh, the arrangement was that uh, the mines, Cases were built uh, at Geelong by the Ford Motor Company. The mine explosives were made up in Maribyrnong. They came down by road to um, Swan Island. The, they went by rail from Ge uh, sorry, the cases went by rail from Geelong to Swan Island. They yeah. were then married up uh, without the debts and primers. So um, debts then, being de detonators. Oh, sorry, without the detonators and primers. Um, so it's as safe as half a tonne of explosives can be at this stage? 
Well, they actually had two sizes of charge depending on the application for the mine. Mm -hmm. uh, they had about 240 kilograms in a, what I call a normal mine. Mm -hmm. But if the mine was being laid in a strong current or uh, in very deep water, and there was drag on the cable, they would use a smaller charge, about 145 ki uh, kilometre, uh, a k kilogram uh, charge. So okay. uh, now, although they, n most of the mines were Mark 14 British mines, which had uh, the common uh, Hertz chemical horn that I think everybody knows, mm -hmm. but the last 426 that were made were m a conversion of that where they replaced the Hertz horns with switch horns, and then it became known as the Mark 17 mine. Uh, but they only be made them towards the end in 1944, so nearly all the mines were Mark 14 with Hertz horns. So they were assem assembled minus the detonator and primer at Swan Island? Yes. And, and did, did Bungary pick them up from there? No, no uh, it's by coincidence, uh, Bungary actually went to Geelong to, to load the mines. So the mines then had to be ch sent by rail from Swan Island up to Geelong. And you'd have a, a, a special dedicated train, obviously. No, no, it wasn't used for anything else. And they'd have several train loads go up. Okay. Cause, and Bungary would take on a mine load of, well, normally 467 mines. So uh, that was quite a few railway carts to... Uh, Shunter or um, send up to uh, Geelong. So they were actually loaded at Geelong. Okay. It then had a, a long passage at set ten and a half knots to get up to the mine laying areas because the mine laying areas were all north of Townsville. So they had a long way. A long way to go. So David, I understand um, that when they actually got the mines in to Bungaree and made it its way up to, to, uh, to Townsville. Um, the captain, had Norman Calder, had some trouble actually deploying the mines from Bungaree. Can you tell us a bit about that? A little. Uh, the actual deployment of the mines from the vessel wasn't too bad, but the lead up to that was a challenge. So uh, Norman uh, had been trained as a torpedo officer with the Royal Navy, and that's where our mine warfare expertise came at that point, point in time. So he'd come back to Australia and he'd expected that there'd be a, a level of knowledge here. Mm -hmm. Basically he said, all right, you've done the torpedo course, great. You can look after mines. Okay. <laughs> um, thankfully he was a little bit of a gambler because there wasn't a lot of knowledge. Um, Navy headquarters at the time understood the strategic importance of mines. They kind of got where you might want to lay them. That was about the extent of the knowledge. Okay. So in terms of being able to lay a detailed field where you should put mines, that knowledge wasn't there. So he sort of went, oh, geez, what do I do? OK, um, I understand gambling, I understand probability, not gambling, probability. Um, I'll have a chat with some other people who understand probability. So he went to the University of Sydney mm -hmm. and spoke to the mathematics department there and said, look, can you help me? I need to understand probability a bit more scientifically so that we can work out where to lay mines. What he was hoping for was a fairly simple sort of formula uh, or equation that you can plug figures in, distances, explosive weights, etc., and it would give you a good plan for uh, for a minefield. What he got back was an inch in, or a half inch document that confused him even further. So <laughs> basically, he sat down with a uh, with the base, his seamanship knowledge, his knowledge that he did know of mines and their explosive weights, and a shared load of graph paper and just sat down and methodically plotted them out. That one doesn't work. Right, try that again. Okay, I think that will work. Um, and that's where our expertise at the time in mine laying came from. Wow, okay. Heck, I realise we've talked a bit about, about producing mines and, and, and the, the, the challenges and you know, how to lay them and so forth. But we haven't really talked about the purpose of Australia's mine laying effort. Um, what were we doing? Australia had, uh, in fact, three prongs in its mine laying. The first one's not generally known, was offensive mine laying. Mm -hmm. And the, un, uh, the, the, the ship that laid them uh, is HMAS Australia. <laughs> not even mentioned in uh, the book on, called Flagship. Okay. But, but Australia was serving the Eastern Fleet at that time. And the Admiralty, correctly, had assumed that at Kerguelen Island, 
mm -hmm. which is in the deep south of the Indian Ocean, near Heard Island, or mm -hmm. near, it was on a big map, but <laughs> actually a long way at sea, but it's that, that, that far south. Yeah. They'd realised that the German raiders were using those islands to uh, repair ships, to give a bit of recreation to the crew, i.e. walking amongst penguins, and uh, supply. Mm -hmm. So uh, they decided in October 1941 to deploy uh, Australia down to the Kerguelen's to lay mines. So mm -hmm. she went to Colombo, topped up with uh, 18 ground mines, magnetic ground mines, and sailed down in early November, laid the mines in about three or four potential bases and uh, went back to Cape Town and by then Japan had entered the war and she headed east to left the Eastern Fleet and headed back to become flagship for the RAM. Okay. So that was the offensive mining operation. Right. The the next the defensive mining done by Bungaree, as Mike alluded to, she laid uh, over 9,000 mines <laughs> but before Japan entered the war she laid three minefields, one in Port Moresby, anti-invasion, mm -hmm. she laid a thousand mines done on the graph paper. Uh, she then laid some mines in Torres Strait mm -hmm. and from looking at the uh, where they laid them, I think they were targeting a, a Japanese surface submarine. Okay. And then she laid uh, 400 odd mines off Cooktown, mm -hmm. uh, again aimed there at stopping a, 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 a raider coming in from sea mm -hmm. into the Barrier Reef. Once Japan entered the war, she then uh, went up to Numea, which at that point was an important US naval base, mm -hmm. and she laid a thousand mines there anti against a submarine uh, approach. Okay. Uh, New Zealand put their hand up because part of their anti-invasion techniques was to have a couple of minefields. Mm -hmm. So she laid a minefield off Auckland and off the Bay of Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, and then her major role was uh, in the Barrier Reef, mm -hmm. where she laid a couple of thousand mines uh, over 500 miles okay. north of Townsville, but, you know, which then provided a secure passage for US ships proceeding up to New Guinea from any attack from seaward. So that was a major activity was laying those uh, defensive fields. Okay. In badly charted waters, Bungaree's a single screw ship and the seamanship of the captains involved was magnificent, I would suggest. Okay. The third uh, string of our uh, mining uh, def was defensive mining was what's called a controlled minefield. Mm. That's a field where you lay mines out in the harbour, connect them to shore and some poor sod sits there waiting for a ship to come in and, and press the button. Uh, in fact they were never used but we, we laid uh, control against evasion, we laid them in Botany Bay, uh, Broken Bay, Port Stephens, Newcastle, Townsville and Cairns mm. uh, and uh, then the Royal Navy laid a couple in Brisbane because that was a major submarine base for the US Navy. The Royal Navy they, they were all laid, but never. The Royal Navy them. laid them in Brisbane. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yes. It was a, really, a, a, a real well, joint we're effort. We were very close to the Royal Navy in that era. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Mike, we've started to mention the Japanese um, uh, a fair bit. Um, did they have a mining effort? What was it like compared to the Germans? A and and if we had to respond, had we had we learnt much by this stage? The Japanese mining effort was quite small and uh, very ineffective compared to the German mining effort. Um, they had a mine sweeping squadron, uh, four submarines, and those four submarines came down uh, and laid uh, mines at Darwin and Torres Strait in January and February uh, 1942. Mm -hmm. um, they never sank a ship. Um, the moorings parted very early. In fact, four were washed ashore before they finished the mining operation. Mm -hmm. And they provided the first Japanese mines to the Allies in World War II. Um, Why was that significant? Well, that was the first intelligence that the Allies had on a Japanese mine because there hadn't been any mines recovered before that. Okay. So the ones that four at Darwin, which broke adrift after only a couple of weeks, uh, gave us a, a windfall, an intelligence windfall. Okay. And, and the Americans were quite interested in sending people out to, uh, to inspect them personally. Okay. Um, as soon as these mines, it became obvious 
that the, mi the mining had taken place. And incidentally, Deloraine had sunk one of the four submarines in the process. So the Japanese lost the submarine for no good effect. Uh, but uh, the 24th mine sweeping flotilla swept uh, around Darwin. They were completely unaware of the mining operation at Torres Strait, but they swept around Darwin, didn't sweep any. Uh, and that, at the end of the war, well, almost at the end of the war, the Americans got, got plot, plots of both minefields at mm -hmm. Torres Strait and uh, Darwin. So the 24th went back to both areas, knowing where the mine should be, and they didn't find any. So <laughs> as far as the Japanese were concerned, all they did was lost the submarine and gave us four, well, not, not just four, there were many more washed ashore. Um, the Torres Strait ones ended up uh, along the west coast of uh, uh, Queensland. Uh, near, and uh, the others were pretty close to Darwin. But um, all in all, it was not much of a, um, an operation. Uh, that the first one, but then a, a one that could have been or should have been more effective was a Japanese submarine came down, not from that squadron, which uh, just a lone submarine came down and mined off uh, Brisbane. It laid nine German uh, GS magnetic, well, sorry, German influence mines mm -hmm. uh, supplied by the the Germans, obviously, uh, and they did a, uh, a reconnaissance. What they thought was a pretty uh, effective reconnaissance, but they didn't get it right, fortunately, and they didn't lay them in the established channel or into Brisbane. However, what happened was that Swan, during a uh, gunnery uh, anti-aircraft gunnery exercise, actually actuated two acoustic mines at a safe distance. So we got that windfall in the sense that we knew that the minefield existed. Okay. So Gimpy was uh, ordered to sweep the, the general area and did sweep one acoustic mine. Uh, after that, there were a number of uh, US Navy yard minesweepers, the wooden hull minesweepers, they built about 480 of them during the war. Wow. And uh, some went to England, about 150 on Lend-Lease. But others were stationed in Australia, uh, Cairns and Brisbane. So they, uh, they were tasked then with sweeping just about everywhere around, around Brisbane. And they did that for some months and they didn't sweep another mine. So uh, there's still six German mines sitting off Brisbane. Somewhere. <laughs> But it, all in all, uh, compared to the German effort, it was it was a fizzer, to, you know. And we we probably well, I think we gained more than uh, it was it was a plus as far as we were concerned. We we sank a submarine and got the intelligence on the Japanese mm -hmm. lines. Okay. Heck, I'm just wondering, as the the war moved, uh, the Pacific War uh, uh, unfolded, the campaigns moved closer to Japan. Were the Australian minesweepers involved they were, as it progressed? They were heavily involved, and it all fits in the relation in the, the creation of the British Pacific Fleet. At the Quebec conference in uh, September '44, Roosevelt accepted Churchill's offer of a fleet, British fleet, to go to the Pacific to join the U.S. Navy in prosecuting the war against Japan. Mm. Uh, immediately, that was agreed. The Admiralty requested the Naval Board provide 18 of the Admiralty paid ships, minesweepers, to form the 21st and the 22nd minesweeping flotillas. Mm -hmm. uh, the 21st was to be used for uh, mechanical sweeping, i.e. sweeping wood mines, and the 22nd was to be an influence sweeper, okay. or sweeping squadron. And the two squadrons were formed uh, by early November mm -hmm. and uh, devoted to the British Pacific Fleet under Admiral Bruce Fraser. And, uh, but they weren't, it, they, they, there's one bit of minesweeping was done in uh, Manus Island, which by then was a uh, British Pacific Fleet forward base. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, two, two, of our, two of the MSF-21 did a sweep against possible Japanese board mines but achieved nothing in, in early 45. Uh, but the, the, uh, the 21st and 22nd were mainly em employed in escorting the fleet train, which is a brand new concept for the Royal Navy who used to operate out of bases. And of course, operating in the Pacific, they had to have their own fuel stores, etc. And so they introduced this massive fleet train. And the main role of the 21st and 22nd flotillas was escorting. Okay. And they did a lot of towing as well, like a um, you know, sh ships were damaged, that so. Mm -hmm. The other less happy event, they used to uh, they'd have a duty minesweeper at every forward base, and they used to often take the dead out and bury them, which wouldn't, wouldn't have been a very fun uh, task to undertake. But, but basically, they, they were in the Spruance's fifth fleet, they mm -hmm. took part of the uh, operation against Okinawa, and then Hasley's third fleet against the mainland Japan. So that, they were there, and four of them were at the surrender in Tokyo Bay, four of our minesweepers. So they really were involved throughout? They, they were heavily involved, okay. fully involved, but not minesweeping. Oh. There was a little bit of mine, uh, once the Japanese surrendered, there was a bit of minesweeping in uh, the islands, to, mainly to clear a channel mm -hmm. through to uh, allow ships to get in and capture, get our prisoners out and get the Japanese prisoners back to Japan. But, uh. but so basically, through the war, there was a little mine, very little. Okay. The, the, the operation against WIWAC, uh, the uh, we did some sweeping there because the Brits had laid a defensive field, okay. which was due to have expired, and they did a check sweep there to make sure before we invited, the Allies invaded to check that wasn't there. But, but, yeah, but the British Pacific fleet was a major undertaking. Mm, okay. David, I'm just reflecting. We've discussed uh, the, um, the fact that mines a very large amount of explosive um, all designed to be set off by a ship. Um, and, and as Mike's mentioned, um, when they come ashore, um, th that, that gives us a chance to, to understand how they work um, w when it's an enemy mine. Just wondering, was anybody in the Australian Navy involved in this? And, and what did they do? Ah, absolutely. Um, in fact, a number of our most highly decorated naval officers were involved in this task in the European theater war. Mm -hmm. So um, early on, of course, we, we ended the war at the same time as Britain did, being part of the empire back then. A number of uh, people the Royal, it, were in the Royal Australian Volunteer Reserve under something called the Yachtsman Scheme. They went to Great Britain, continued their training there, and went off to various areas. For some reason, um, a large number of Australians, perhaps because we're mad buggers, ended up in this explosive ordnance disposal area or called Render Mine Safe. But there are four officers in particular. Uh, Leon Goldsworthy, mm -hmm. uh, George Goss, John Mould, and Hugh Sim. I believe your house at ADFA was named after uh, Hugh Sim. Yeah. <laughs> um, these Randall Syme. Syme, sorry. Yes. Now, these four officers uh, played a very key role in the diffusing of mines, but part of that is also exploiting the intelligence. Okay. of a mine when you find one. So if you, if you come across one, and we still do it today, that you haven't found before, then the attempt, first attempt will be to try and diffuse it, render it safe, mm -hmm. so that we can find out how it works. Um, that information can then be passed to other disposal personnel to render other mines safe. Um, these four officers were all awarded the George Cross, which is the second highest medal for valour in the British honour system, second only to the Victoria Cross. Mm. And it was all for extremely dangerous and arduous conditions. I'll just talk about um, Hugh Syme because mm -hmm. he's a, what he did is a really good example mm -hmm. of the sort of tasks these guys did. So over the course of uh, 1942, he'd rendered a large number of mines safe. Um, but uh, that year in particular, he did 19. And one of those particular mines, the one that he actually got the George Cross for, was um, buried and it had to be excavated to a certain extent. Um, as he was trying to pull it apart, the thing was live. So as he's touching wires, he's getting painful electric shocks. Um, being the mad bugger he was, he continued on. Um, and at one point he was head first upside down in a mud pit trying to defuse this thing. But he succeeded and that was one of those occasions when he was uh, gaining intelligence 
which enabled other people to then diffuse that type of mine safely. Uh, Leon Goldsworthy, he diffused over 300 mines himself. So the, the lads were in it, they are in the thick of it. Crikey, yeah, it's very impressive. Um, heck, we've talked a little bit about, well, you've talked a lot about the, the 21st and the 22nd um, flotillas. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in how the, the information that was gained from the diffusing of mines in Europe, where the war had sort of started earlier, whether that information was transferred back to the Pacific and able to be used by the, the, the mine sweeping flotillas here. How did that work? Yeah, the the, uh, the RM, RMS activity in the UK did transfer to the bomber miners. I'll use the term bomber miners, Faisal, but once Japan had entered the war, the RN uh, introduced RMS, Render Mine Safe <laughs> Training at Flinders Naval Depot. Okay. Uh, and But also the Army at that point were heavily involved in bomb disposal. So there were two schools, the RMS one at Flinders, mm -hmm. which initially was run by a Royal Naval Officer with the knowledge of what was going on in the UK, and then the bomb disposal school mm -hmm. uh, run by Army, which uh, the RN put both sailors and officers through both, both classes. Initially, uh, in the early stages of 42, the RN requested Army support for bomb disposal, and as we turned officers out, we slowly took over and had bomb disposal. It was called uh, RMS and BS, <laughs> which is an unfortunate acronym, but BS standing for bomb safety. Okay. But it later became bomb disposal. Right. But we had officers posted to Sydney, Brisbane, Cairns, Townsville, Thursday Island, Darwin. Okay. Then as the war moved at, in, in 42, 43, the uh, RMS or bomb disposal officers went with the army. So the difference mm -hmm. between Australia and well, the Pacific and uh, UK is quite profound. In UK, they were driven to very dangerous, sophisticated German mines, chauffeur driven and <laughs> peeled off and got buried in mud, etc., rending safe, very sophisticated mines. Out here was just the opposite. They were there with just behind the military as they fought the Japanese mm -hmm. in the mud with the mosquitoes and rendering safe mainly bombs and Japanese booby traps, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there's no record of how many people qualify. But looking through Navy lists, I reckon about 35 officers and mm -hmm. a similar number of sailors qualified in, in this particular field. Uh, they lived in dreadful conditions and, and were in fear of their life. But Herman Gill's official history of the RA in World War II doesn't even mention them. Hmm. And again, in, as Mike mentioned uh, earlier, very few awards were handed out. Hmm. A fellow called Charles Croft got an MBE, and he was the one who rendered safe the first Japanese mine that came ashore in Darwin. He did the course a year later, <laughs> but he got his MBE. I guess he learned on the job. <laughs> a guy who no one's heard of called Lieutenant Harold Leon Billman. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he worked in uh, New Guinea, he got an a MID, Mentioned the dispatch yep. in New Guinea, and then he went across uh, working with the U.S. Navy in the Philippines, where he earned a distinguished service cross. Okay. And uh, then there were two uh, two officers, uh, sorry, two more sailors, uh, Lieutenant Nankerville and an able seaman Peel. Mm -hmm. They worked together in New Guinea, rendering safe bomb, uh, bombs. And Nankerville got a, an MBE for mm -hmm. extremely hazardous conditions, and the able seaman got a BEM for hazardous conditions, <laughs> they're actually together at the time, but that, that was it. That was the only awards given in the Pacific for bomb and mine disposal. Oh. The task, I presume, didn't finish at the end of the war either, because uh, we've laid a fair few mines and there are a lot of the, enemy mines to be yeah, cleared as the, well. The Allied came to an agreement that uh, Britain and Australia would clear Hong Kong, southern Japan and islands to the south of the Philippines mm -hmm. And the US would do the Philippines and islands north, Japan, etc. So we, uh, the Brits, under the British Pacific Fleet, they decided to retake uh, Hong Kong just before the surrender, mm -hmm. which they advised they shouldn't go until 3rd of September. They went in late August. The, the 21st and 22nd were spread throughout the Pacific. They were everywhere. Mm -hmm. So Admiral Fraser asked the Naval Board, could he take eight uh, minesweepers from the 7th Fleet, MacArthur's Fleet? Mm -hmm. And the Naval Board agreed, and they, they got together in the Philippines, and they sailed with uh, Admiral Harcourt's uh, 
squadron into Hong Kong. They led the way, cleared the path, and uh, the Admiral came in with his uh, destroyers and cruisers. The battleship and the carriers were left at sea, but it came in later. But so, and, and, and over, that was in sort of late August in uh, 45. Mm -hmm. And by the end of September, the 21st and 22nd had assembled with the additional eight ships from the 7th Fleet, and they formed the 21st, 22nd. The 21st went on to do an enormous amount of wire sweeping in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. north and south of Hong Kong, and across on the Chinese mainland in uh, Amoy and Swato. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 22nd, who were due to do influence sweeping, as Mike mentioned earlier, the, uh, they realised that it wasn't safe to, s given a steel hull ship that mm. left the water, etc. So they, they cancelled influence sweeping. And the 22nd went on to do anti piracy patrols and conducted themselves with a plomb, such that the OIC, Travis, ended up with the mentioned dispatches. So he, okay. he did well there. But uh, both, both squadrons committed themselves with a plomb. Okay. And, uh, but then uh, the 20th Mine Sweeping Flotilla in Australia was reformed in late 45, mm -hmm. but focused initially on check sweeping the, Japan the uh, German minefields around the south. Mm -hmm. But by uh, right at the end of 45, Rabaul were complaining. They only had one, they, they couldn't put their ships alongside because there were a lot of uh, mines laid, allied mines, ground okay. mines. So they requested assistance. So. MSF-20 sent two ships, Deloraine and Echuca, and a couple of HDMLs, which mm -hmm. they towed. Yep. They went all the way from Sydney up to Rabaul. And Deloraine, who'd sunk the submarine off Darwin, she, that was too uh, cluttered to be able to tow your, your influence sweep. So she devised a situation where she anchored, and the HDML pulled the sweep out, and she sat there pulsing at anchor. And they, they swept Rabaul, and then they were sent off to Kaviang, which was just north mm -hmm. and east in uh, New Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, th they, were, they were in the Kaviang one afternoon, a Diamond Tina came down a passageway, which they knew had influenced mines. So she was uh, advised when she sailed out not to come down the passageway, because the next day a Chuka tailed her uh, influence sweep through that passage and exploded a, a magnetic mine. Then Deloraine went on uh, using her method of uh, anchoring and having a HTML take the loop out and pulse, and she swept over a period of a couple of days seven magnetic mines. Mm. Apparently, when the mine blew, the HTML at the end of the tail went up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they did a magnificent job. Okay. And by June of '46, the MSF 20 had finished mm. in Australia. They, they joined up in Rabaul. They finished a lot of uh, moored mines laid. The only ones swept were by HDMLs, in fact, okay. off the Duke of York Island. And one of those passed by the side very close, which could have had a different ending, but didn't. Then they uh, swept Kaviang, then they went across to Bougainville, mm -hmm. and uh, to the south on the west coast and on the north, they swept uh, there until November that year. Okay. And in Bougainville, they disposed of 53-odd mines. But so it was quite a, 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 an active mine-sweeping campaign in the islands, and they deployed for long periods. Conditions on board were dreadful, overcrowding, no air conditioning, no movies, no fresh food, because in Rabaul, there are 100,000 Japanese ashore. The only good news for the mine-sweepers is they allowed the Japanese on board to do the maintenance of chip, <laughs> chipping and painting, etc. But uh, they, they worked very hard and worked very, very effectively. And the other big mine-sweeping campaign was clearing the mines of the Barrier Reef. Okay. Bung Bungarese mines. And as uh, I think Mike mentioned, there, there were 37 minefields mm. and uh, the 20th mine facility, which consisted then of 11 uh, AMSs plus SWAN, and they had uh, four HDMLs, they, they'd be active as Dan layers, mm. etc. And they, they uh, initially they swept south of Cairns, then they moved north of Cairns. Okay. And that was a, 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 you know, the last hurrah for minesweeping. But it was a massive effort, a lot of, lot of uh, time spent, and very successfully. Sounds Apart from like one incident. <laughs> well, as you say, it sounds like a successful but very hazardous, mm, yeah. um, arduous mm. activity. Um, HMAS Warrnambool was, was sunk during this. Um, Mike, can you, can you talk about the circumstances of, yes. of the incident? Um, it's pretty simple. Um, Warrnambool was sunk primarily uh, the primary cause was the uh, 
inaccuracy of the existing navigation systems, okay. but it was exacerbated by uh, a hazardous environment. Um, the, as we've mentioned earlier, um, Bungaroo laid just over 5,000 uh, mines along the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, up at the northern end at Cape Grenville, uh, there were two minefields at Coburn Reef. Uh, minefield Home was at the northern end and Minefield Pole was at the southern end. And the mine sweeping uh, finished in October, but so they were almost finished when they swept uh, went to Coburn Reef. It was uh, they intended starting on the 12th of September, but the weather was too bad. Uh, and what they intended doing was dividing the flotilla into two divisions: one at the one for Pole at the southern end, and one for Home at the northern end. Well, on the 13th, the conditions were still too bad for Pole at the southern end, so conditions were marginal uh, for the northern end, but they formed up a division. Uh, Swan was senior ship and guide. Uh, there were two uh, corvettes as minesweepers, Warrnambool and Mildura, and the corvette Kat Katoomba was Danlayer. Mm -hmm. Now, as well as that, they had two HDMLs, 1326 and 1329, for precursor sweeping and uh, mine laying, uh, sorry, <laughs> Dan laying. Well, um, the 1329 uh, surveyed the area. They were very apprehensive about it because it was a very, uh, well, there were um, all sorts of submerged parts of the reef, niggerheads. Um, and what have you, and so sh she spent the morning trying to find a, a safe place to start. They were going to mm -hmm. progressively work along the minefield, but they were going to start at the south end. So at, by, by 1200, she did her initial survey. She'd laid three Dan boys, mm -hmm. and she started a sweep uh, along the line. Now, the idea was that she, she would sweep a path 100 metres wide of clear water for Swan because Swan as guide was out ahead mm -hmm. and she was in un water that wasn't cleared by the other minesweepers. Mm -hmm. The other minesweepers were all right because they were all in water that had been cleared by the minesweeper ahead. Yep. But, but uh, Swan was vulnerable. So she went uh, through at 1200 but uh, sh the sweep parted on one of these pinnacles or whatever you like to call them and she then had a, a very difficult task recovering the sweep mm -hmm. and replacing it because it's a manual on, on an HDML yep. in these marginal, can, it was marginal for sweeping, let alone launching and recovery manually. Well, uh, she managed to get, uh, replace the sweep and she came through again and she was sweeping to the north of the Dan line. Uh, and then Swan would run along uh, the, the Dan line. Mm -hmm. uh, she started, she got a clear run at about 14.15. So then the, the t Corvettes and Swan formed up to the west and came in. At a, it was a very confined area. They had to avoid islands and goodness knows what. It was very difficult. But anyway, they formed up, they came in and... Uh, for about, uh, would it have been about 1500, no, no, it would have been later than that. Uh, they swan, uh, her f f uh, sweep fell at the bottom. So, Warren uh, Dill did the SOP, it went in, in Swan's wake. Mm -hmm. Well, Swan was very lucky, it passed a mine <laughs> very close by, as best I can work out, about 20 metres on a port bow, uh, on a port side. But Warren Bill, hit a mine that was in the Dan line. Now, that might seem odd, but what had happened was that the current had changed between the precursor sweep mm -hmm. and the uh, clearance sweep with the Corvettes. Now, the Dan's watch, as we call it, they go on a circle around the, the anchor, mm -hmm. according to the current. So, if it's a southerly current, they move south and so on. Well, 
the current had moved the dan line 20 metres. So what it meant was that the, when the uh, HDML went through, it missed this mine by a whisker. <laughs> it was just out. And uh, then the dan line moved south, and then, of course, the mine was um, exposed. Uh, sorry, the mine was exposed, okay. and only just. So it was incredibly unlucky. Uh, well, out for uh, for Warnerville, and incredibly lucky for Swan, actually. Hmm. Now, um, so a so level of precision that that was almost impossible oh, at yeah, the time. The, the, so I mean, yeah. on top of anything else, there were no secure reference. Uh, navigation references on the reef. I mean, they were trying to take cuts on the edge and this sort of thing, and it was a uh, very difficult uh, navigation problem. And the navigation officer on um, Swan uh, did a very good job, but uh, the system just was too inaccurate. Okay. Um, after Swan, well, Swan sank fairly quickly. One ball. <laughs> water boot, sorry, <laughs> fairly quickly. Uh, four sailors were killed. Um, oh, sorry, I'll have to read their names. Ordinary Seaman Highlands, Stoker Garrett, Able Seaman Sig, and Sigelman Lott. Uh, their names were added to the honour roll here in the Australian War, War Memorial in 2013. Um, there were many other injuries, of course. Uh, the the, board, the uh, emphasised that this was a well-planned operation mm. and it was very carefully conducted. Uh, and in, to quote from the Board of Inquiry, the loss of Warrnambool was due to the inherent difficulties and dangers involved rather than want of care or neglect of reasonable seamanship precautions. Thank you. David, I understand we still do a lot of this mine clearance type work, particularly in the islands to our north. Um, from World War II era um, uh, mines. I'm wondering if you can just talk briefly about certainly. about what the Australian Defence Force still does. Okay, so certainly as Hex talked about, and Mike as well, a large number of mines were laid by ourselves, the Americans, the British and the Japanese throughout the Pacific, plus just the battles that occurred throughout the islands. So at the end of the Second World War, everyone's had enough of war, they want to go home. So a lot of stuff was just disposed in the ocean and a lot of stuff still remained, the remnants of the Second World War throughout the islands. Mm. Um, as a consequence, accidents have occurred in the past uh, and it was decided by the Australian government that we would do something about it. So in 2009, Operation Render Safe was created mm -hmm. and Op Render Safe continues to today and it's the ADF's Enduring Explosive Ordnance Disposal, EOD, effort to support the Southwest Pacific nations. Okay. Um, we send teams of sailors predominantly, but also Army and Air Force. Uh, we send ships, we've sent mine hunters, we've also sent chules as a support vessel. And on occasions, Kiwis, Canadians, uh, US and Brits have also joined the Australian team. So it's a joint and combined operation at times. To give you an example of, of what's occurring, so in 2016 in the Solomon Islands, um, the Op Render Safe team disposed of nearly 19 tonnes of explosive remnants from World War II. It's very impressive. Yeah. Very, very good task. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm just wondering if I could have some brief concluding thoughts. Um, I, I, from my point of view, I think the fact that uh, so much effort was put into a bomb and mine disposal, that come the end of the war, those people dispersed and uh, to maintain it in mainstream Navy, they formed the Insurance Diving Branch formed mm. in 1951, and part of their role includes bomber mine disposal and continues today. So it was a very valuable contribution that uh, endures. Thank you. Mike? Um, from my viewpoint, the, as Heck alluded to, the uh, cancellation of influence sweeping at uh, China due to the um, AMSs or Corvettes having an excessive magnetic signature. Um, I should add that two Corvettes were very lucky, Strawn and Ballarat. They did uh, act detonate uh, mines, but uh, uh, magnetic mines, but uh, they came off uh, virtually unscathed. They, 
which I think is testimony to the rugged nature of the four wets, partly, but also a bit of luck because. The, um, so anyway, the Navy learned its lesson from that, and when uh, the final influence sweeping operation was conducted at the Solomons, it was by uh, small uh, general purpose vessels, GPVs, uh, that were wooden hulled. They had special degaussing coils fitted. Uh, they towed a different type of, uh, or different version of the Corvette sweep, but it was still the same principle. And uh, as it happened, they didn't sweep any mines, but, uh, and uh, it was not until uh, the early 60s when Australia got the, the six ton class that we had an ocean going influence sweeping mine capability. So that was, if you like, that's the legacy as I see it. There was this gap after the war. Thank you. David? Uh, for me, it's just the continuing disproportionate effort that you have to put into mine countermeasures mm. to counter mines. Um, it is something that is not particularly glamorous. It's very expensive, particularly with a country of the coastline the size of Australia. Mm. We couldn't afford to have sufficient mine countermeasures forces on a permanent basis. But what we have continued to do is have a strong cadre that we've always seemed to be able to build just in time to the force that we need. And for a country like Australia, who's so dependent upon the sea and maritime trade, it is absolutely vital that we remember the effect that mines can have upon us and at the very least, we retain a very strong cadre of mine warfare countermeasure forces. Gentlemen, thank you. It's been fascinating. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Australian Naval History Podcast series. There are plenty more to be found just by searching for Naval Studies Group in your podcast app. Bye for now. <laughs>